Welcome to the Nia Jachuan podcast. Uh, my name is Isaac. Uh, this is a bi-weekly podcast where my friend Jess and I discuss internal martial arts, meditation, and qigong. Uh, this week, we continue our discussion on Liu Hongjie. Uh, we talk about his meditation, his connection to Wu Jin Chuan and learning Tai Chi. Uh, then we shift over to talking about the first swing a bit more. This time we talk about the connection between the swings and the three Dandians, and as well as the difference between Dandians and uh, Jiao or burners in internal martial arts. The second half of our interview with Lee Birkin should be out next week. Um, if you haven't checked out the first half, you should give it a listen. It's good stuff. The interview will be up on our Patreon. If you don't know what Patreon is, Patreon is a member platform. Uh, we use it to post uh, extra interviews, additional content, uh, some training stuff. So if you haven't checked that out and you're interested in that, you should give it a listen. If you're already a Patreon member, we appreciate your support and thank you immensely for uh, your support along the way. And some of that, uh, what we're doing we haven't really announced it yet, but we're going to be doing some projects, some larger projects coming up in the next year or two. Uh, so the Patreon will help support that as well. Uh, there'll be more information about that as it comes out. Um, anyways, uh, thanks again and take care. Welcome back to the Nate Jod Trend podcast with Isaac and Jess. We've been discussing opening the energy gates of your body by BK Francis, a seminal Qigong text. Um, and we've been uh, going through the story of his training with many great masters. And now we've reached the point of uh, his final teacher, Liu Hongjie of Beijing. Um, and where we left off, uh, Liu had finally passed away in December 1st, 1986. Um, so this paragraph here ends that story by saying, after being extended the honor of stirring Leo's ashes, usually an act confined to the immediate family, and then there's a little footnote, Leo had officially adopted Kumar as his son in a Confucian ceremony, Kumar returned home to the United States. And uh, that's the end of his training in Beijing for the phase of his life. Um, and I don't know about the tradition of stirring the ashes, but uh, it sounds here like that's something that's, uh, you know, part of a traditional funeral process. Um, and that he got to participate in that. So it sounds fairly meaningful to him. And, you know, when you hear him talk about Master Leo, he's always quite reverent and feels like you hear him say nothing but respectful things and how he held him in such high esteem and admiration. And I think that this, this sentence speaks to that a little bit of that feeling of awe of being part of something with uh, deep roots, you know, and part of tradition, China's traditional cultural heritage, you know, it's quite an honor for that he was able to participate in that um, culture. Being part of a lineage is more than just a piece of paper. Mm. And I think he, he you know, he, uh, he took it very seriously and he's very traditional in, in how he approaches teaching and, um, you know, I don't think that stuff was to be taken lightly, at the, especially at the, you know at that time. Uh, yeah, it's. A, it, I've only heard him talk about it a little bit, and you know, it, it sounded like it was a fairly. You know, it ha it happened the day after he learned the last little piece, so I think it was kind of a shock to him. Yeah. The level one level i agree you're right when he talks about it, it did seem like you know the guy was quite old obviously but he he just it, the stories he's told of that day it just sounded like it hit him like a ton of bricks and wasn't quite ready for that to happen you know was, he'd kind of reached the mountaintop of his martial arts journey and then the guy he was putting you know uh, he cared so much about passed away but that's i guess how life goes and death does come suddenly upon us doesn't it the, you know? the, the story he told me was that the day before leo died he did the thing where he put his hand on his shoulder and just like picked him up and moved him across the room and put him down with like uh, magnetic force kind yeah, of with, with the, <laughs> the, the the yeah the the just without any gripping just you know stuck to him and picked him up <laughs> uh, so you know that's pretty and when he told me the story the look on his face was just you know I, like he still couldn't believe that it had happened you know it's kind of funny. yeah there's there's some talk you know some pretty wild tales out there 
from the masters for sure so yeah there we are at the end of uh the teachings of master leo um looking back at the end of opening the energy gates there's a section appendix d that i wanted to touch on where it adds a little bit more to the stories of leo hung jay um he begins by saying uh this section says leo hung jay's education as a taoist master leo hung jay began to study martial arts at the age of 12 and here it lists uh he studies shaolin he ends up being accepted as a disciple in the what he calls the beijing bagua school at the same time he also learned xing yi from members of the school and outside teachers so it sounds like he this beijing bagua school and we're hoping to get a lot deeper into that down the road um he learned Xing Yi as well as from members of the school and outside teachers. So it sounds like there was this, this Beijing Bagua school was a gathering place for multiple strains of Bagua and Xing Yi that trained together in one place in the 1920s in Beijing, which is interesting because as far as I know, that's sort of the time period where the, the styles of Bagua hadn't fully calcified and split apart after the death of Yin Fu in 19, uh, uh, the death of Cheng Tinghua in 1900. There was still a unification among the schools for a couple decades after that before it truly split apart to separate styles, maybe comparable to the death of Ueshiba and Aikido, where, you know, it was still one Aikido until his, he passed away. Um, and, and at this time in the 1920s, I get the impression that there was still a lot of cross training happening between the second generation members of the Bagua school. And clearly, Xing Yi is a part of it, too as well as I'm imagining Tai Chi, but he lists Xing Yi and Bagua as training together during this 1920s. And I think the reading we've done over the years, we've seen that come up again and again, that there was this merging in the 10s and 20s of Bagua styles and Xing Yi styles together. Um, yeah, well, I don't know as much about the, you know, the Bagua lineage stuff, but I know that there was a group that both of Leo's main Xing Yi teachers were part of. Um, that was essentially a um, like a, a martial art club for uh, people of the, the the heads of it were Wang Xujing's teacher, uh, Liu Duquan's son, and uh, Liu's teacher, uh, Li Jiangkui. Mm, so Xing Yi. Yeah, so that those guys were, and they were all, you know, roughly the same branch of Xingyi, but there was some uh, cross, you know, a, a, a little bit of other schools. Um, so I know that group was heavily, you know, had a lot of Bagua people in it. For example, Lee Kung Yi, uh, and and folks like that were in it. So they, you know, or Shang Young Shang. So they did Bagua also. I mean, you know, I, I, in one, on one level, I think it's funny because these guys were probably better at Bagua than we can even possibly imagine. But they they considered themselves to be Xing Yi guys, right? So they they didn't. Yeah, but it's like in reality, you got to they pick were, one side or the other. But you definitely were doing both, right? I mean, but but if you think about you know these guys who trained with Chen Ting Hua directly but they still consider themselves to be you know shingy guys and that's it's, right so, it, so there's a real friendship and linking between the two schools that happens at this stage it's kind of unique uh, not all chinese martial arts have like sister styles that they mix with like that you know yeah um, the, so that's I mean, pretty the, cool the classic one is the what is it the kung yi and shen ting Hua, right that they were they were buddies or whatever and um they had the isn't that the one in the Bagua Journal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of stories in the Bagua Journal about the schools connecting. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Leo Hung Jae was a guy who witnessed that firsthand. He got to participate in that meeting of the schools. And he mentions here how different instructors would come through. Members of the school and outside teachers would visit. And it sounds like there was friendships and connections, maybe even business connections from the, the bodyguard era of the late 1800s and early 1900s. Yeah, where these guys were... As far as I know, there Bruce one time said that there's a there's a picture floating around of Leo when he's younger and he's sort of wearing like a tank top and he's doing bagua, and Bruce had mentioned that that was at a, a place that some guy had donated for training martial arts training. Mm. Uh, my theory is that that guy was Gang Ji Sheng because he had a academy that they, they 
that's what they called it. It was basically a club, a hangout place. And every single one of Leo's teachers was either a main like guy there or came through there and taught. So Wu Jen Chuan mm-hmm. came through there. Uh, Chen Yolong came through there. Magui came through there. You know, so all of these dudes were hanging out because it's a, you know, it was a small, I mean, I, even now it's a small community, but back then, you know, it was a, it was a real tight knit group. I think they knew, you know, we better stick together. <laughs> you know, when times are good, you can pick on your friends, but when times are bad, you kind of got to take your, uh, down, al- yeah. take your allies where you can get them, you know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Cause I think in the long run, you know, the, the Lincoln project. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, sometimes uh, you're on the same, it turn, you, you might squabble among each other, but in the long run, if someone is, you know, in your style in the long run, you guys do end up having to stick together, like it or not, because yeah. nobody else is going to stick up for you. So I'm turning to the next chapter here. Uh, I'm not chapter, next sec, next uh, paragraph. Um, it speaks about Liu Hung Jae heading down to the Hunan branch of the Central Government's National Martial Arts Association where he, in, he encounters the sons of the famous Wu-style Tai Chi master, Wu Jintren. And later, Leo became Wu Jintren's formal disciple and lived in Wu's house in Hong Kong. So it sounds like he, at the end of his martial arts education, turns to Tai Chi in the 1930s and got deeply involved with this Wu-style Tai Chi. Right. This was the era of the Guo Shu Guan, the, the um, national martial arts schools. And Leo was a head instructor at one of those schools and Wu's son or sons. I'm not sure if it was both of them were junior instructors. And that's how, you know, he made, made the connection. And I don't think he had had much interest in it prior to meeting uh, Wu Jianchuan. I think he thought he had enough to do with Xingyi and Bagua, but apparently he, right. He must have been impressed. Yeah. Yeah. He was impressed enough with Wu that he, you know, wanted to learn from him. And what Bruce told said one time was that uh, they were both really into meditation. And that was the the thing that they kind of they bonded over was the the application of meditation to Tai Chi and martial arts. So it's something I kind of can relate to. Totally. Yeah. It sounds like they're on the same wavelength. And so we'll, you know, I, I'm hoping that in future podcasts, we can delve a lot more deeply into that relationship and the things that were going on there. Yeah, and season the season same, two. <laughs> yeah. And in the same vein, he mentions here at the end, just sort of lightly, uh, Leo continues his, his training in Buddhism. He then spent 10 years training with Taoist masters in Shezuan province in Western China, completing the practice for becoming one with the Tao. Um, and I, we haven't really talked much about Leo Hong Jae's Taoist beliefs and practices. And I think as we go further, we will definitely delve into that more. But you can see here that he was clearly way into it. 10 years in the mountains, that's a real traditional process to undergo in Chinese Taoist literature. You go off to the mountains and spend 10 years hard working, and then he returned to society to take his place here. With And it ends with, with the ascension of communism in China, he returned to Beijing where he lived out the rest of his life, quietly teaching only a few students and perfecting his practices. So he ends sort of quietly returning to Beijing to just carry on with his work, even under a somewhat brutal and definitely hostile communist regime that was it proceeded to ban martial arts and Taoism pretty much entirely for most of the rest of Liu's life. Well, and, you know, and he came from a family of, of doctors and intellectuals. So, you know, that was also a, um, red check. Yeah. yeah that was a, that was a red flag or no, pun right. intended, no pun intended, but yeah, um, true. An amazing life from a, you know, what an experience to get to, tr- to train and learn from somebody with what a, a life story like that. Yeah. I mean, just on the, on the meditation thing, from what I understand, he started learning meditation he started learning meditation from some of the Bagua guys, uh, Ju Wen Bao and Magui as, as well. And then I think that sort of piqued his interest. And in, uh, he had done the Buddhist stuff. Uh, Bruce claims he was enlightened by a certain sect by the time he was 30, uh, which then I think when he was in his, I believe it was like his 40s, 
he went up into the, you know, at, after he'd had kids is what Bruce said. After he'd done his, you know, familial obligations, he took off to the mountains for 10 years. And I think that's where a lot of the, what Bruce refers to as the monastic Bagua that he teaches that stuff. I think that's where that comes from. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of, I think where Leo probably synthesized some of his stuff, you know, made it cause his, you know, everything he does is a little bit different than the way other people do it. So I always assumed that that was during that period that he, um, perfected his uh, yeah. particular style that makes sense. Or whatever, yeah that's yeah. kind of the capstone of his training was to go into the mountains and get deep into religious practices so it's got to be yeah, sort of his I'm, finishing i'm sure he was still practicing bagua and shingy while he was up, up there Absolutely. in the mountains you know? and Absolutely. uh yeah so then he comes back and i like i think i said in the last podcast there was a period of time in the 60s where he was teaching publicly and then Baiwa that started around that time as well. So there's, you know, that the, I think there was a brief, you know, period where they thought they might be able to do it. And right, like, this might be know. able to continue, but then the uh, cultural revolution hit. Right, like and then the there's that, wave. that sort of lockdown of the cultural revolution, which Bruce showed up right after that, in a sense, where you yeah, know, th there was a lot of, as he put it, there was a hangover of you know oppression from be living under the you right know, the stress right communists for 20 years or whatever um yeah that was a crazy stretch of history all right well maybe we should uh pop along yeah moving on to chapter seven of opening the energy gates of your body we're looking now at the first swing which comes after standing dissolving and cloud hands so the first chapter begins by discussing how the swings energize vital organs and joints the next three exercises called Swai Shou in Chinese and generally referred to as the swings in English have the basic function of energizing the organs as well as opening up the joints. So now these type of actions, you're, you're swiveling and swinging and swaying your body a lot more in order to get the juices moving even more than cloud hands. Cloud hands is where you start moving. It's somewhat precise, somewhat careful, whereas the swings are a little more juice is moving in your body and it's a little more active. And uh, anyway, so now you're really warming your body up and getting the joints going. Um, I wanted to bring up the part where here it says the lower Dantian near the belly is the source of life in the physical body. So he's talking about the various different Dantians. So this first one is, is located in the belly and he calls it the source of life. When we begin this kind of training, how, how do you go about getting into the Dantian? Because this has come up a couple times. How, if someone hasn't been able to feel their Dantian, do you want to like poke your finger there or do you want to just stand until you can feel it? Do you want to like breathe into it maybe? All of the above. Whatever it takes. Yeah, Anything I mean, you can do. Um, Find that center of balance, that center of gravity that the lower Dantian is. The unfortunate answer is practice more. Keep practicing, keep practicing because the, the answer to the question of how you do any of this stuff is in doing it right. That, um, how do you feel your Dandian? You practice feeling your Dandian. How do you get softer? You practice being softer. How do you get stronger? You practice things that make you stronger. So the, I mean, a simple way to think of it is cloud hands is walking. The swings are running. Hmm. Right. It's it's that level of you're doing a very similar action, but one is done slowly, carefully with a lot of you know thought involved in it. The second is still has the same level of awareness and thought, but it and mechanical it, is the same. Right. Yeah. So and, and, and the same. I mean, it's the, the, the cool. like the leg mechanics of this first swing and cloud hands are. Identical. Until until you get into opening and closings are identical as far as all the turning and stretching and all of that stuff. So you don't have to do anything really different when you go from cloud hands to the first swing other than speed up. You know what I like to do sometimes is, well, I'll do 10 cloud hands, then I do 10 first swings, then do 10 cloud hands, go back and forth, you know, between them. And that, that sometimes helps you keep your alignments because if you separate the two – 
you can sort of get distant, but I've, I've found it's kind of nice to just do some cloud hands, then do some swings and contrast them with each other, you know, sort of test myself and keep those alignments good while I do some swings, then go back to those alignments again in cloud hands and weave them together kind of. Yeah, I think I kind of think of them as a yin and yang mm. situation, right? Mm. One is, the, you know, they're they're opposite of each other. They're they're one is a slow grinding thing of getting your body to become unified. The other is taking a unified thing and making it become loose and limber. Because you can you can do cloud hands and not really get l- loose hips, for example. You can sure. still have fair, you know, you can hold yourself in these weird positions. You can't really do the first swing with really tight, you know, holding yourself in a tight position because you have to speed up. And the act of speeding up, it it, it kicks in some of these self-preservation things where your body starts to do things in a way that your conscious mind can't think that fast so you your body has to feel it and you know when you start to run you're you're not consciously aware of every little thing because you're trying not to fall over same with the swings the the stuff you did in the in standing in the and cloud hands has to be really solid before you can do the swings fast so right like you were saying you can go back and forth you can do the swings like cloud hands. You can do cloud hands like the swing. So you can do your cloud hands sort of fast and loose mm-hmm. to start, you know, to, to make that transition from doing a slow, steady cloud hands. You kind of loosen it up. You go a little bit faster and you see what that feels like. And then you just let your arms drop. So is in the midst of speeding up your cloud mm-hmm. hand, it just, you let go and it becomes the swings. So it's, again, it's that back and forth. And then, you know, obviously you could, reverse that and go from the swings back to cloud hands and it's it's just that internal control right that that right comes with moving faster it's like anything you know anything in martial arts or any activity you start slow and you speed up right and the reason you do that is your body has to learn how to do that the you know, it has the pathways, right? The, mm. the neural pathways, the physical pathways, all, all the different connections have to be made first. And then you can speed up. Uh, first swing is, I mean, if you want to take it into a more martial context, I've always thought of it as cloud hands is the contact, the blocking, the controlling, the grappling stuff. The swings are the strikes mm-hmm. and, and the kicks and the stepping and, and that stuff. Um <laughs> The ballistic type of movement. Yeah, the ability to let something go fast, right? To to do something quick. And and I remember the first time I saw Bruce do uh, cloud hands fast. He started speeding up. And by the time he was, you know, going as full speed, it was, I was blown away. I'd never seen anybody move that fast in my life. You know, I was like, what the hell? Just zapping out sort of piercing palms by doing it. It was like, it was like watching Mike Tyson do the, like a bunch of uppercuts. It was that kind of speed. You're just like, what the hell is that? Um, And and especially coming out of this big rotund guy, you're like, he he doesn't look like the kind of dude that could, uh, you know. Pretty quick. So moving forward into the next paragraph, we talk about the, Middle Dantian, located around the center of the sternum in the heart, is the energy center through which a person connects and forms relationships. Um, this is compassion, uh, place thinking and emotions um, and intentions are all taking place here. Uh, so this seems like a pretty critical energy center as well. You know, we talk a lot about the lower Dantian where your physical movements are sort of rooted. But when it comes to the middle Dantian, that's where your your heart energy is. Um, Interesting. It's what Bruce refers to frequently as the heart mind. It's the place where your intent and your non thinking mind merge. Unconscious. Yeah. Once you merge this heart mind thing together, your intent and your physical body kind of are in, are linked. So all of the stuff in Xing Yi, for example, is, kind of working on that same principle right that there's this linkage so in terms of energy stuff you've got the top well you haven't said the top yet but 
but you got the top, the bottom, and the middle. And so the bottom is connects you to the ground. That's why you do the lower down yin first. The middle connects you to other living things, and the top connects you to spiritual mm. things. So the heaven, earth, man, right? Uh, triplicate, exactly. And and so what that what happens is you open up the bottom, you open up the middle, you open up the top, and then the they all kind of merge in the middle. And that that's this that's this heart mind thing when when all three dandians link. Um, Interesting. And that's like the that's the uh, all of the meditation stuff. That's kind of the the jumping off point. Once you've made that's that, you're, yeah, you're entering that realm of uh, meditation and alchemy and stuff like that. That's the point where you now have the ball of light. So then we move to the next paragraph. The upper Dantian, located in the third eye, is responsible for connections with discorporeal beings, subtle forms of thought, and other dimensions and places. Whoa. Right, so that's the what we would just in the West call the psychic, right? The, the, sure, the spiritual center, right? Anything, in your forehead. anything that has to do with non-physical entities, right? So thoughts, spirits, you know, all that stuff. Um, the cosmos, even other dimensions, interesting. Right, I mean, well, that's the... The way the way the Taoists look at it is these three dandians, these see three center, each one is sort of tuned to a certain frequency. And so when you activate one, it connects you to the things that are on that frequency. Uh, but Qigong is mostly about the bottom, you know, about the lower dandian because it's right. Like, that's it's that's the next sense. Yeah. In terms of Qigong, so we're talking, we're mostly concerned with this lower Dantian. He says the upper ones are used for more advanced Qigong or for uh, Taoist meditation. So those don't play a huge role, especially in this first Qigong set here. So to finish out the chapter, we turn away from the Dantians to the Jiao, which he calls the burners, the three burners of the body, the Jiao. So this divides your body into three sections as opposed you know, these Dantians are located in specific spots within your body. The three jiao are a way of chopping up your body into three sections. So there's right. this lower jiao, which which is the lower dantian and everything down to the floor. The middle jiao is the one from the lower dantian up to the solar plexus. And then the upper jiao is from this solar plexus all the way to the top of the head. So you've, you've sort of got these three dividing line or three sections of the body. And he says here that each of the different swings affects a different one of these three jiao. Right. So they directly work with these three sections and indirectly sort of activate these three dots. Yeah, that's that's the impression I'm getting. You squish and squeeze the Jiao, whereas energy flows through the Dantians, and that, that's a little more of a subtler process. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely more of a subtle process. But the but the concept of just these three, you know, the three burners, the three chunks. I mean, in terms of energy gates, the main thing is to try to make them all work together, right? That you're not twisting your shoulders and, you know, disconnecting from your hips or whatever. So the awareness of where they, you know, where the boundary is of each one is, is important because when you start turning, especially when you start turning fast, those are the places where you're your alignments are most likely to break. So somewhere around your solar plexus is, is a big one. People twist in there. Your hips, obviously, you, so that's your lower burner. People over twist that or twist their knee something, instead, yeah. right? Instead of just turning it. So the, um, the swings are kind of this repetitive action this back and forth, like a windshield wiper it's back and forth back and forth back and forth back and forth and what they do is they they lubricate all the physical stuff in that area they they, they soften it they stretch it they twist it until everything in there is pliable so that the the physical connections um start to pump fluids and fluid fluids start to pump chi and then you activate these these energy centers so when i first started bruce was really on a lymph node trip 
and it was all about pumping pumping lymph mm. node when you did the swings, right? That this closing action in the quad would pump the lymph node, and that would create a fluid movement in your body. And fluid movement in your body is essentially the thing that keeps it healthy. Um, so, you know, the swings again. I mean, from one point of view, it's about loosening up your hips and you know strengthening your legs and having good knee alignments and all of that stuff. But it's also about increasing the internal pressure that you um that you started building in cloud hands so cloud hands is this you know you, you pump the thing up and then the swings are like now just get all the parts to be loose to be free and in each each of those parts but through that squishiness and that movement and that fluid pump start to naturally organically connect to the other parts as those fluid movements flow between these different jiaos, these different regions of the body, they weave together ever more connected and ever more, I wouldn't say strong, but ever more synergistic and connected maybe is the word. Yeah. Uh, twisting. Is, I think I said this before, but twisting is kind of like the, it's the mortar. It's the thing that, that links all the different parts. And so the swings are this, you know, it's very yin yang kind of thing because it's a fast movement. It's a strong movement. I mean, if you ever, you know, when you do the swings properly, if your arm hits something, it isn't your arm that gets hurt. Just letting your arms become completely soft and letting your belly become completely soft and just having this sense of you're like a big amoeba kind of just squishing in space and and that nothing there's no resistance in any part of your body and yet you don't lose the alignments that you have that you you did in cloud hands and all of that stuff and obviously to do that you're going to have to hold yourself back from swinging as hard as you can you you're going to have to hold yourself within the the space that you stay comfortable because if you push yourself with these, you can crink or kink or snap or pop something. Absolutely. You really want to stay in a real liquid area and just trust that over time that area will increase and your ability will will of itself build on itself. You know, no, you can you can test yourself once in a while, go faster or bigger or whatever, but in general, don't over grind the swings. Keep keep it light. Keep them feeling good. Yeah, it's the 70% rule, right? I mean, we've said this over and over with everything because it is the guiding principle of all this stuff, which is your, your turn, your shift, your speed. Everything is dependent on maintaining alignment, connection, whatever you want to call it. And you don't lose that. You never go faster than you can maintain these this sense of internal connection and that's why standing you know is so important because if you can't tell if you're connected when you're going fast that's how people hurt themselves one of the main things i teach probably the main thing i teach is how to turn and shift the body so people don't hurt their knees that when you start doing martial arts and you're going fast the main thing that becomes a weakness for probably 70% of the people that I've come across that do this stuff is the swings. They can't do the turning and shifting stuff. And, and then all this compensation kicks in. So it, it, it's the primary skill of, of most of this stuff. Uh, Bruce one time, he jokingly, but it, it wasn't really a joke said, you know, you could, you could create an entire martial art off this first swing because it, it encompasses all, almost everything that the physical body can do right i mean it's um it's not always obvious what those things are but you know it's shifting it's turning it's twisting it's it's swinging the arms it's pumping the lymph nodes it's you know all like everything's moving so it's a it's like i said it's like running it just it's getting the whole body to just go and, and, and so, most importantly it's got that looseness and that sweeping power that when your arm just when you just just turn your body and your arm goes with it without any thinking, you can create a ton of power. Even the lightest person can create a knockout blow with the oh, by, yeah. with just the turning of the core of their body. 
So it's the kind of the simplest way to get that soft internal power. And yet that's something that's, it's, it's almost mental that stands in the way of making it happen. Cause I know I struggled for a long time to get those swings to carry any weight. And it took a long time to soften up enough to feel it, but it feels like I should have been able to get there faster. Anyways, well, it, yeah, it's, it's, good- fi- it's finding the, as Bruce calls it the Goldilocks point, right? That you have a certain place speed, all, you know, all the, these different things where they all are at their 70%. And it takes years for you to figure out because it's constantly changing, right? That, that as your body ages and things happen, Mm. things shift around. So there's never really a set like, okay, this is what it is. But, but you learn as, as your ability to feel gets better, you learn to say, okay, I'm not in alignment. I'm, I'm in alignment. And as you do something like the swings, it's like it's college level alignment where cloud hands is like high school. You know, now you're getting into, like I said before, it, it's uh, you're out of the parking lot driving on a course and now you're on the highway and you're going 65 miles an hour. And it's like, you better know the basics before you do that. And so the right. swings are kind of this, this really, a uh, big jump in terms of uh, physicality. I didn't do the f- swings for almost a year and a half that I, I you know, I learned them in the first weekend, but uh, Bruce was real clear about, look, don't try to jump ahead. And so I was, you know, I listened and I just did cloud hands for like eight months. And then I, <laughs> you know, then I did the first swing real slow for another five months and just I don't think I got my arms up in the air for a year, but you know, it took, but at that point I could, then I could do the turning and not hurt my knees and stuff. So right, take it slow. I go back and forth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just take it slow and, and be, be mindful of your uh, limitations. I think is the main thing. Good advice, brother. All right, bro. See you later. Uh, yeah. It's Isaac again. Just a quick uh, thank you to everyone who's been listening. Hope you have a good holiday. Uh, As always, like and subscribe. And if you haven't checked out our Patreon, do so now. All right. Take care.